discussion all based around um, you know the relationship between agile lean and devops um, so to clarify not the the sort of differences between those methodologies but just more the, the key challenges you'll face uh, you know when implementing them and, and just within them um, so um, before we get into the key talking points so uh, I've got lined up uh, we'll do some introductions really for people that will be watching back and um, and uh, yeah what watching the recording so I'm Christy I'm a quality and test consultant for expertise recruitment expertise obviously place IT and, and technology talent up and down the country um, me personally I, I place great testers specifically within the Northwest um, so yeah um, over to you Paul I mean are you okay to just you know introduce yourself what you do who you work for yeah, sure. So I'm I'm Paul Hodkinson. I'm the CTO of Food Hub and Touch to Success. Um, so we are a challenger or disruptor to the online ordering um, takeaway industry. We we like to sort of rival ourselves against Just Eat, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash. You think of the big names in that industry. We're we're trying to do something slightly different. We we operate a 0% commission model, which tries to ensure that everybody gets the best part of the, of the deal. Really, that's, that's where we're focused. We've got about 15,000 clients that I serve across the UK. We have presence in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, America, and Latin America that we, we serve as well. So we have a 24 seven function. And I think I maintain about 12 different outward bound products currently and i am going through a massive rewrite and transformation project with my teams currently i have majority of my team was originally in india i now have a uk team a uk based consultancy and my my indian development house um which belongs to us it's, it's their employees of our business they aren't an external consultancy that we use and i'm i am going through the journey of picking the bones of what agile meant to the people that originally implemented it what it really means what does devops really look like in the world that i've inherited versus what should it look like and where does lean fit into that that process and that mentality when there is always a demand to do things faster so i think that's what sparked my view on this um I have operated as a CTO across a number of organizations uh, and I generally focus on the startup world generating revenue and investment in organizations. Right, thank you for that. Um, Andy, did you wanna, do you wanna go next? Sure, um, so I'm Andy Norton, I'm the software dev manager at Foot Asylum. Uh, so Foot Asylum, a fashion retailer you know, across the high street, uh, web, mobile and the social channels as well. Um, I've been at Foot Asylum for just over a year now. Um, and for the last kind of 18 months has been a big digital transformation at Foot Asylum. So going from a mostly outsourced developer uh, kind of technology model to bringing it in-house and starting to have kind of digital product teams aligned to different parts of the business. Um, so I kind of joined about six months into that, that whole process and my job's really been to um, to focus on coaching the DevOps practices across the teams um, and helping to also establish Foot Asylum kind of technology within the dev community as a place where people want to kind of come and work. So making visible the work that we're doing, the lessons we've learned, and, and trying to focus, I suppose, on what good looks like across the different teams. So all the way from kind of testing and bringing testers into the teams, whereas uh, we didn't have any testers up until last year properly, um, and also working closely with business and actual customers to make sure that we build the right thing for them. Um, I'm initially from a uh, kind of a .NET developer background, and over the last kind of five or six years, I've moved into more of kind of a dev manager and uh, kind of an engineering management uh, role. And that's what I've been kind of working on and really I'm just helping to make sure we, we deliver kind of as well effective solutions using software. Cool. Oh, and uh, other Paul, um, Paul Smith, did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Paul Smith. Uh, I'm an enterprise architect. I am currently between jobs at the moment, um, but have kind of grown up in startups. Uh, so I've kind of taken on uh, the challenges associated with you know setting up DevOps uh, within a lean uh, kind of startup environment um, and uh, kind of how we would push that through 
um, you, you know, using agile methodologies um, to, to, to kind of make it so that developers could move quickly. Um, so yeah, uh, that's me. Cool, and Murray? <clears throat> um, I'm Murray Tate. I'm a senior consultant at Infinity Works in their Manchester uh, practice. Um, at Infinity, we fairly much um, have all of our teams being DevOps or um, or equivalent. Um, I have a before that, I have a um, history of uh, startups where DevOps are the things you do simply because if you only have five uh, developers, you're doing ops as well as development. Um, I also have a um, a long history of involvement in the Agile community in Manchester starting in 2005 with Agile North, now defunct, and um, uh, have presented or attended panel, panels at uh, Lean Agile Manchester, amongst others. Um, yep. Cool. Um, Josh, I don't know if you can hear us yet. Um, I can see if, is my mic working? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Me? Cool. Yeah, um, I'm Josh McLean. I joined Expertise probably like 10 weeks ago. 10 weeks or so ago, I've been doing recruitment sort of five or so years, moved up to Manchester to open an office for my previous company, but I've always focused around the software development um, area. So now I'm up here, I'm looking to build my own community out um, and working on the same sort of roles, but just specifically in the north and the northwest. All right, cool. Um, well, the the idea, the format today is that we, we've got a few points that I've spoken with you all about, sort of leading up to the event. Um, but it, it, it's not, um, you know, it's supposed to be quite informal, conversational. Um, so I suppose we'll, we'll go around and mention those individual points. But um, feel free to to just jump in and you know talk about your experiences surrounding that. Um, so um, Paul Hodkinson, I don't know if you'd like to start. I know when we spoke um, yesterday and last week, you mentioned that one of the key challenges you've been facing recently, um, you know, when undergoing a bit of a, an agile transformation, is that you know some of your employees think that they're, they're already there almost and about you know instilling that mindset that there's still some way to go so i don't know if you could talk us through that a little bit yeah sure i think the the biggest challenge i have faced is when you you come in on the face of things you have a look in the systems you look at the tool and that's in place you go, okay so um most things are being deployed through git using a branching strategy you see that things are being uh pulled through Jenkins as the, as, the, as the tool of choice. You see sprints set up in Jira on day one. You go, okay, there's some stuff going on there that makes some level of sense that I can, I can work with. And then, and then the things come out of the woodwork. Like, um, by the way, we do sit every two weeks for about three days. And... Um, by the way, we're just waiting for the latest version of the API because it's not available yet. And, oh, that team hasn't started that planned sprint yet because they've just handed it to the test team to work on. Or um, things like, oh, yeah, they're just going to extend the sprint by three or four days just to complete off these bugs. And you go, okay, there's a bit more work to do here than I first envisaged. And I think the challenge i faced was how do you how do i as a, a leader with a remote team in a pandemic i only joined in february found most of the problems in march pandemic kicked in no travel how do i then go about trying to show and lead 130 plus people into a big bad brave new world that focuses on speed and efficiency and small change continuously so um so that that's the project that i've been doing for three or four months and i've had to break it down into two areas and i'd be really interested in your thoughts on this so one area is to i've i've come up with a concoction of tools and processes to help deal with my current bau so moving to octopus deploy um using Terraform builds for environments to stabilize them so I have the same thing across. Getting someone to actively go in and make sure that 
uh, master and develop aren't too far apart unless there's some work actually being done on develop making sure that people aren't just merging to master pulling from there and merging straight back onto it which has been fun um and and then looking at more progressive tooling so where i would like it to be so looking at cdk and how do we how do we ensure that we have a team that understands its full remit in a software development life cycle so focused on the software development itself testing that that code that you've written as a developer as well as having a test framework built in there plus the infrastructure so moving more to a mono repo style setup so they're the they're the things i'm trying to do um my approach has been to just go all right i'm going to build some stuff on the side i'm going to get it working when it's successful i'm going to roll that out across the team i'm going to embed people into it wondering whether anyone else had the same challenges same problems whether they've done it a different way what learning they've had whether they've done it the same way and the sort of learning and and how you think that moving teams that haven't haven't necessarily been as agile as they think they are and moving them to this full mono repo style of working which is very uh very modern how how you think that's going to go really so i've got some questions for you if i jump in um what's your motivation to go to devops and agile and how does that compare to the people that you're actually trying to come uh, bring on your journey so that, that that's a good question i asked myself whether it was worth it before i started so the if i had a if i was going into a board meeting and everybody said oh so we're planning for a release in three months time what 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 kind of small changes can we expect in three months i would probably not do what i'm doing but when i go into a board and say did you deliver the seven thousand things we asked for in the past week and i go no because this blocked it and that blocked it and this happened and that and most of them would be the reasons i i explained up front um that's why it is an essential part of what we do is the, the the speed needs to be there and actually the biggest thing for me in all of this is i need to join up all the interdependencies in one place so that when a small change goes through it can go through and not break something else and i need to monitor that and have stable environments where that happens um with regards to the people and are they ready for this I've gambled on the fact that I can get them ready for this and I can I can do this because I think everybody wants it the team wants it there isn't a there isn't a question of people going oh what are you want about this th this sounds horrific this is a big change for us we don't like it everyone's gone this is how we should be doing it so every person's on board with the journey it's just that change mentality of moving from one world to another and then okay, we achieved that step now we're going to go on to the next one as well. Um, so I think I think to answer, yeah, uh, it is essential based on the amount of change we do, and the people want to be involved and they want to do it. So my 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 question would be, how much automation do you have around kind of taking? Obviously, the developers are working on branches at the moment. How does that currently get into a live state, uh, and what are the what are the processes that need to go around that? And what are the QAs doing? Um, are they building automation or are they, um, you know, manually testing this stuff? So I'm going to backtrack to the first part of what you said is, and your team are using branches. And let's start there. Um, we have branches in place, but we don't enforce the branching strategy as well as we could. Um, so we one of the reasons we've implemented octopus deploy is to actually enforce the the merge process properly through from from local from the develop branch onto a onto a box that then automatically triggers sanity tests that then allows someone to go that's good i'm going to take that and i'm going to take that onto an environment and test it properly myself now so we we've done that to sort of deal with the branching problems we've had and we now have active people going 
Why have you got that stale PR request there? Why have you pulled that branch here? Why you added a branch on top of a branch on top of a branch? Stop doing things like that. Either have a release branch or a hot fix. So we've, we started to rectify that aspect. Um, with regards to automation uh, and, and the testing journey, one of the big challenges is we, we don't have uh, front end tests written by the development teams. We're not using a Cypress, a Jasmine, a Protractor, or anything like that. It's, it's all been developer writes code, tester writes test. And one of the big changes and why I talk about, why I've mentioned lean and things in this is uh, we don't do the free amigos. So we don't have developer, product owner or BA and, and tester all sitting down together up front and going, what's this piece of work? It tended to be, oh, I've got to use a story. I'm going to go write some code. And then the tester sees the code and goes, I'm going to go write some tests without actually understanding what the output is required by the business. Um, so what that's led to is a dysfunctional set of automation tests. Um, there, there is some automation in there. Um, it is now being triggered within the pipeline. Previously it wasn't, it was a manual test to trigger it. Um, but the, there is definitely a, a, an expectation from the team that they can get that working more effectively and efficiently within the, within the pipeline. But we, we probably have about 40 to 60% coverage of some form uh, of the known tests that could be there. Makes a lot of sense. So I have a kind of a quick question. I suppose one of the things that we've, over the last few years, is kind of implementing lean and looking at reducing handoffs with the teams and like, you know, the lag time between value added work is actually moving branching and using trunk based development. So you're committing code to the main branch and you're wrapping it enough safety around that so that every commit is an atomic commit, which has all the safety around it, that it could potentially be a live candidate. Um, uh, uh, what, what, what we've been doing at Foot Asylum is looking at going from no ops, no sort of nothing agile at all, where work was kind of, um, great. so it's kind of tailorism, and kind of down, top down work so there'd be the IT director the old IT director would say to the senior product manager we want to do this piece of work the senior product manager would then take that work give it to the other product managers the product managers would then give that to individual people across different teams um, which was ineffective there was lots of handovers lots of context was lost so one of the things we've tried to do every step is look at kind of a value stream of where how long does it take a piece of work to go from being an idea to actually get into live and if there's any parts in there where we've got lag time, for example, where somebody has to wait for an environment, somebody has to wait for testing, somebody has to wait for something to merge a branch or fix a conflict, you know, there's no value being added in those times between those different work things. Um, so we've been looking to really reduce all of that. So go, first of all, go to kind of predictable delivery, have a, have a baseline, and then look at optimising and moving those dials. So how can we move to a really lean model of there's the fewest kind of Gaps between value added work, you know, like the, there's nobody waiting around because they have everything within that team that, to be able to do the job that they need to do. Um, so, what I just mentioned, you mentioned about kind of branching and stuff, and we found that in our view, it's, it's been a bit of an anti pattern to, to have branching because ultimately it leads to lots of handovers and lots of times where people are waiting around and, and things like that. I think that it comes back to the mono repo, is mono branch as well as much as possible. And to if of course most of the work happens on a featured branch, but then you get back in as soon as possible. Do you have your value stream completely mapped out and as visible to everybody as possible, so that if there are bottlenecks, if it takes time for things to happen, you can see it. You 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 can feel that everybody can feel the pain. Is that for me? No, uh, Paul. But for me. Um, we we do now we literally deployed a service this morning that visualizes that uh, i was on a demo this morning of it um i think going back to uh to, to what andy was saying and 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 what you just commented there Maury, actually is if if i was if i was told that i need to re if, if i was told that this is the vision this is the product set that you need to have and it doesn't exist today, but this is exactly what you need to have and you get to build it from scratch. I would implement what you were talking about. 
and the way you were doing it, but to retrofit that with with what I have to not have to almost have the mono branch approach um, and, and through that atomic design that you were you were, the the pattern that you were talking about that is uh, systemically a major change to the way that we do things mainly because the amount of products we have that interact with one one another and maybe i didn't begin with um i don't know if i want the core challenges we have a monolith that sits there that commands everything so when we make one little change we're coupled everywhere so if i want to change if i wanted to run a refund process on my platform i have to change six products to run it and it's just one small change in one small area and it's a catastrophe for other teams and other departments to deal with it's so i think once we move out of that monolith and we have a have, have the, the new api layer running as a platform um what you're talking about is, is is almost my one of my targets to achieve uh, i really like the idea of value stream mapping um we look at that from two perspectives or at least we're, we're implementing this from two perspectives one is from a product from a product set what value streams do we have that run through end to end? So if I have my products running horizontally, how can I vertically slice them into value? Uh, and then we have a look at the cost of delivery. Um, I particularly focus on this with the test team, the cost of bugs. Uh, finding a bug should be really expensive, not really cheap. And at the moment it's really cheap and that's a key measure for me is how much does it cost to find a bug? Uh, and how much does it cost to actually get code through a pipeline? So do you, do you have uh, kind of the bounded contexts uh, for which, which services need to be deployed together to kind of get something running? Um, yeah, loosely. <laughs> so so one, of, one of the things, because th we've, we've been through exactly the same thing, right? Um, and, and one of the things that we did was we, we made kind of a, a mono, um, pipeline that essentially would take those projects and deploy them all as one, um, which then allowed us to kind of, you know, hopefully, um, you know, make changes in any one of those projects and they all get deployed together, um, which then allowed us to then not have the headache of, you know, what version is this thing on, what version is that thing on. Everything was in, you know, a stable state every time we deployed it. And then from there, we kind of drew the bounded context out and then kind of pulled those out into individual microservices so that we could kind of, you know, break apart the monolith. Um, yeah. Which isn't the easiest thing in the world. So, uh, so what, we, what we've done is we've identified significant pain points in a release. So we've watched the releases and gone, ah you didn't think about this that and the other they we work out where they're coupled so we, we've done that and we identified that one of the the key causes for this was the end-to-end -end test mm -hmm. not actually being an end-to-end -end test it's i'll end-to-end -end test this one part of the functionality of the journey rather than when that happens over here it needs to run all the way over here and back it was it was um uh, sort of like little tiny ecosystems for each end-to-end -end test which was causing us an issue so we fixed that problem and then what that gave us was it gave us a view of the coupling that was in place so it would allow us to notice where there was breaking changes and we we we, we sort of put the api in place so that uh, there was we're, we're running a lot of front-end changes. So we've got a stable version of the API. We put that in a box, right, then you can call that. If we need to do an API change, we'll coordinate it. If you're just doing front-end changes that don't impact the API at all, then you can just keep on pulling the version that production's running all the time onto this box. So it's helped, that's helped us enormously. So one, one of the problems that I can see there is that you seem to be focusing heavily on end-to-end -end testing. Um, I would flip it on its head and, and do very small discrete unit tests um, uh, so that you essentially you know kind of the, the functionality behind the scenes is, is working as it should um, and to define the interface points um, so that they don't necessarily change um, and have tests around those interface points so that you know that they're constantly um, you know uh, 
in a state where you know that if if there's something that is going to change that interface between that service and another service is going to stay the same what it does behind the scenes doesn't really matter as long as it kind of you know returns the same thing um and then from that point forward um you know as as you've got those interface points if there's a breaking change you can create a new interface for that um and have your unit test make sure that you've not broken the old interface um yeah yeah, we've, we've been trying to do it. Yeah, but could also just I'd say that's the kind of model that we've kind of gone from these very expensive end to end tests that don't really add a lot of value and are quite brittle to yeah, they're to having, you know, most mostly unit unit tests, but then these consumer driven contract tests to yeah. kind of have this almost this barrier between two services where you know that if you're making a change, what the impact is of the direct consumer. And that help that's something that we're working on right now, but um it's 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 reducing, I suppose, it means that the, the, the testers are spending less time building tests that are going to need to change every day whenever any change is made to get involved in the very start of the development process and helping to kind of define contracts between services and understanding where that, that coupling is. And then the conversation then moves to what is the, the, when we say orders, do we have orders leaking out into other kind of context of the domains and can we realign the, our code base so that there's a clear distinction between um, things like an ordering service to maybe a checkout to a stock service and stuff like that and try and bring them into not a, a microservice but a right size service that has a, a very clear definition and there's a, a separation between that and a, and a consumer and, and there's, a, there's, there's really good tools out there uh, like Sonar Cloud um, that will allow you to kind of pick up on the number of unit tests that you have that and enforce policy first, first tool I implemented yeah exactly so you know, you can you can you can create policies, which mean that the the number of unit you know test coverage and the number of unit tests can't drop. Um, so you you know, and you can set that bar higher and higher and higher, which then means that as time goes on, you know, because none of this is easy, right? Um, as time goes on, your test coverage increases and your confidence will increase with every release, um, and it kind of you know forces the developers to think about what it is they're developing and how that can be tested rather than um you know i'm just going to throw this at the qas um and they can worry about it yeah there's um there's an interesting there's an interesting piece that i'm 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 dealing with at the moment which would really bring this point to life is if you imagine just a basic form that requests some information from you maybe it's uh maybe it's a form that requests your personal details your name your address mm -hmm. Um, across our different services, um, someone has historically potentially bastardized that data contract across the API and across the UI. So I will have a different range of forms with a different range of styles and a different range of validation across it. Um, so see, I, I agree the best, the best thing to do is to have that, that contract in place that says, if if i'm going to pass data into this and i'm going to receive data from this that this is the point that if it breaks i know straight away yep. there's an issue with what i've done I, I i agree one of my big challenges is standardizing working out that what those contracts should be and standardizing it across the stack as well to say every time we do a piece of form work or we, we do an we do an address piece this is how it's done there's no variation. Every time we want to do a menu, this is how it's done. Every time we want to do something, we and, and start building those contracts out because they don't exist. And that's a it's, a, it's a big challenge to get to retrofit them across our code base, where it does need doing. And that would that would offer so much value to us. Yeah, I mean, we, we went through exactly the same pain. Dates always cause problems because there's about a million ways to do dates. Uh, error messages. You know, when I when I when I first joined the company that I'm at at the moment. There were 15 different ways to do an error message to from an API, um, and, and basically we we kind of set up a chapter meeting where these things were talked about by the by the teams of developers, um, and they they decided on the standard, um, you know, get them involved so that they can define what it should be, um, and then once you've got that definition, anybody that deviates from that is you know lambasted by everybody in the team uh, because they don't want another way to do things. What, what, one thing that really made me laugh, we, we put the, you know, the, the Google address lookup 
the type ahead search for the Google users. Yeah. You start, we, we, we were looking at a screen and went, oh yeah, we should, we should implement that search function across all of our sites. Uh, so we went, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. So we, we put it in and then I went into, I went into update my address details in one of the applications. I went, why isn't the search function there? Why have I got to do this manual form? And they saw the one screen and went, I'm going to put it in that one place. So rather than standardize an address lookup across the entire platform, it went in one location and didn't go everywhere else. It's things like that that you go, <sighs> okay, let's, let's work on this. Have you got architects where you are? We brought, we've, we've, we've brought one in from a consultancy to, to work with us to define some, some of this piece, but we're, we're light on the architecture. Front. I, have, I have a guy in, uh, in the team that's been here a few years. He is, who is, he's good. He is, um, he's inundated with requests because he's, he's been the architect to 120 developers. So it's him versus them almost. And he's, he's just inundated. So I, I'm starting to look to bring, bring an architect in. I'm looking at two different, two different architecture roles, actually one across my back office platforms and one across my infrastructure and how things should sit together at an enterprise level. Yeah. Cause I, I, I think that's one of the key things that we noticed was that, you know, basically just by sticking an architect between a couple of teams, um, means that those sort of things can be teased out, have a discussion in the architects group, um, get your leads involved in that architecture group. Um, because then, you know, they'll, they'll tell you what the problems are. Um, a lot of the time. Um, and then you can usually find ways like, you know, we've got a bunch of new get packages for the standard stuff. Like, you know, if you need to handle a date, this is how you do it. If you handle, uh, a, 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 you know, an error message, this is how you do it. If you've got something that needs to take an address, this is the standard DTO that you'll use, um, and kind of so forth, um, just to kind of bring those standards throughout the team. And again, those are heavily tested pieces of componentry with defined interfaces that don't change so that everybody across the estate can kind of use them um, as just building blocks to kind of you know, create all this functionality that's coming off the back of it. Um, and I take a contrary point of view. If you can. <laughs> so I actually think that architecture is it's something that should go as low as possible, um, that everybody, all, all the developers at least, should be doing the architecture instead of all right there's certain standards like date yeah that that's a good idea but forming contracts and that kind of thing what i've done previously is try to set up a client relationship um uh, situation if a team's building an api for other people to consume then they reach out to the people that are going to be consuming it and treat them as the customer and say what do you need out of this how am i going to produce this how do I not break what you're doing? A lot of agile is about taking the big decisions. So the, the decisions that matter and getting them down to the people that are actioning those decisions as much as possible. A, a freeing up from the ivory tower um, architect and down to the people that can actually make a difference because typically an architect can't affect every change in every code base. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying that the architect should be the be all and end all of every decision. Um, but what, what, what happens at kind of, you know, where I am at the moment is, you know, I, I float between every single team and I see where the problems are. Um, and we've got another couple of developers, uh, a couple of architects that do the same thing. Um, you know, we meet weekly and we go, okay, I'm seeing this problem over and over again. Um, and we come up with a way to solve that problem and then distribute it back out and say hey you know you're doing this a lot like should we look at and see if we can standardize this um not necessarily you know every decision has to be made by an architect it's just kind of you know dip in and out of the team see what's going on and then kind of bring those around it sounds like you've got a very different type of view of architects um so but, so there is a certain amount I, I mean i kind of went the contrary just to pull out the differences of what i was saying but there is a lot of overlap with what we with what you've said i think one of the key roles i think with an architect is to um educate um yeah. what's happening to make sure that 
when a decision is made, everybody understands it, and to grease the wheels to make sure that the getting those decisions out and and actioning a decision is as smooth as possible. That priorities are set so that you can re-coordinate or make these changes. Um, when I was talking about just a subtle twist here, when I was talking about the value stream mapping and making sure that people can see where the bottlenecks are, that's so that they can take actions and deliver on those bottlenecks mm -hmm. and, and alleviate those bottlenecks as much as possible. And that's what the architect will be doing is, is all right, we've got a problem with the APIs breaking all the time, it sounds like. Therefore, can we get the architect to grease the wheels to cause that bottleneck, that pain in your in your delivery to, to disappear? And then you go looking for the next thing. So yeah, architects are a, a, a very black and white. I always, I always kind of see them. You, you kind of get your ivory tower kind of, this is how things will be done and nothing can change from this. Um, and then you get the other type, which is very hands-on and, and kind of moving throughout the team. And you definitely want the second type. Um, you don't want somebody that's going to dictate everything to anyone because nothing gets done. Can, can, um, I, can I throw an additional concept into there? Um, I've, 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 I think what both of you are actually saying, um, I was chatting to a head of test uh, I absolutely loved this guy. I thought he was brilliant. And for just because of his location, we struggled hiring him. Um, he is, he was absolutely exceptional. And he, and he had this great process where he said, when I joined, I built up my test team and now I don't have testers. I don't have any testers. I got rid of them. I have a guild. I have a guild of quality assurance specialists that advocate support and information and knowledge to people that are trying to perform a function at any given time and i i just love that comment that he doesn't run a team of testers he runs a pe bunch of people that help grease the wheels and help make things move and i think to achieve that and to achieve what both of you have have said particularly Murray I, your, your your point Murray is, is is really good it's it comes back to that self-serving team that is capable of making decisions and doing things themselves and they, they understand what their boundaries are and with that you require a level of quality that is set as standard that you go okay then we're working at this right level we're up here and therefore we are capable of making decisions that allow us to build a product that is that is going out to market versus actually I'm down here, I need support and advice on how I can do things. And I think when you've got the right balance between there, yes, you can achieve what you're saying about that self-organizing, self-decision-making team. And what you do want is you want the, the architect to be across that, to help give advice and not dictate. So- Yeah, exactly. So when I, when I yeah. go into a team, I'm trying to make myself redundant, right? I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to be the one that's doing everything because there's only like one of me, right? I want everybody to understand and and kind of have that that knowledge in their basket. The best bit for me about all of that is when you have people that offer advice and support and information, is they can go and learn about other things. So rather than being involved in the team on a day to day basis, they can. What I don't want is I don't want someone. I was frozen for me as well. Give you an example. <laughs> we should definitely use Node.js for everything. Okay. What about when I want something really fast? I might want to use Golang. So to me, it comes down to making the right decision at the right time for the, the right thing, not just making a decision because it's been dictated two years ago. And that's, that's for me is where that, that idea or concept of a guild comes in. I really like that. that. That really got me excited to think of having a guild of architects or a guild of testers or a guild of developers. Yeah. So just to focus on your teams a little bit more. So if you've got, what, is it one big team or are the smaller teams aligned to different parts of the, the tech that you're doing or the apps? Or? Uh, okay. Where to begin? Where to begin with my teams? Um, I, I have, 
when I joined, I had, and, and this always makes me feel a little bit sad inside when I explain how the teams were. I had a team of UI developers uh, that worked on React. I had a team of React Native developers. I had some PHP developers uh, for, for some web journeys we do. Uh, I had API developers and testers all working in independent teams. And it just made me feel sad when I, when I saw this and when I went, okay, that's, that's, I've not seen that for a while. So now we have, now we have pods of teams that are multidisciplined that are focused on specific business goals. Um, but this is a, this is a learning curve. I've been in the business eight months. You don't come in and go, I'm going to, I'm going to take you from working that way to the way I want you to work in, in eight months time. It takes, takes a bit of effort. Uh, so I'm slowly moving, slowly adjusting those teams as I go. I think at one point when we first implemented the pod structure, I had a team and when I reviewed it, I went, why is there 22 people in the team? That's four teams. Please make it smaller. Um, so they went off and made some small teams. I'm, I'm a big fan of three people in a team. Uh, I think there should be, you know, two developers, one tester, three people in a team, roughly roughly that depending on your skill set depending on your makeup of business depending on how you're testing how you're developing i think roughly teams of three or four is where it should be at all that can all work across key functional areas of the business one pizza team yeah, yeah. you can fit whatever than seven people go for two <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's interesting how's everybody else got their team set up have you all i take it you've all got smaller smaller teams than 22 in each of your development pods depends <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, okay. so we've 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 got we've got vertical for our business right so um you know customer services are involved in our teams we've got um you know operational people uh specialized people in uh you know medical backgrounds and, uh, and all sorts of things um so Yes, they're not necessarily full, um, you know, development teams as such, you know, is, is, uh, they're not 22 people, but essentially the vertical slice throughout the business is around about 12, 13, 14 people, something like that. But it's essentially that team has all of those skill sets that they can call on and, you know, essentially they're the stakeholders for that team. So if, you know, medical raises an issue and says, hey, there's a, there's a problem here um, with patient safety, then that stakeholder is the one that's got to sign it off um, uh, and, and you know they they've got they're involved in that team on kind of a weekly basis at least um, so that they can kind of have that input um, and we we don't really set the team uh, you know what they're going to be doing um, they come up with what they're going to be doing we set them kind of OKRs and say this is what we want you to deliver on um, you know for instance it might be you know, we, we need something that's going to uh, create a new product that will generate X number of revenue. Um, and then off they go and they decide what they're going to do uh, within that kind of squad mentality with, with the key stakeholders throughout, throughout the business. And then off, off they go and they deliver on that. That sounds a, a, a great setup, but it's not something you want to leap into immediately. Definitely um, not, no. Re re referring back to what you were saying, um, the phrase I like is if you're going to be agile, then you should introduce it in an agile way, i.e. a couple of changes, see what happens, a couple more changes, see what happens. And changing your entire team structure is very, very disruptive. You will go backwards a lot further than you uh, uh, and take a long time to go forwards. Um, and you'll be in... in um, a team forming um, and storming situation um, more often than not, or or you may even not get out of it. So th that's why I like the flow and the customer um, attitude that that each team should look at the teams around them, some of them as customers. And to to bring this on to almost DevOps that we've kind of <laughs> in the title, but we haven't actually said that much. Um, I think that the DevOps the the ops team. The, the way to get them involved is to start treating them as customers. Have the devs go to them and go, all right, you are up at four o'clock this morning doing a deployment. How can I make your life easier? 
and, and you almost go to the next step is the ops people go to service management and say, the customers have got pains. What's the easiest way to, to get them to, to uh, how can I help you help the customer? And, and it goes right through. So you're pulling your value through and you're pulling your quality through that way. Now, uh, Andy, I know um, you mentioned to me as well, um, I think when we spoke last week um, about your teams, I don't know how your teams are, are set up in particular, but that you'd <laughs> sort of struggled with maintaining almost like consistent methodology across all of them. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you want, you want to talk us through that a little bit and, and how your teams are set up. Yes, I, I guess the last 18 months have gone from, I say, no sort of agile, there's no delivery I think that's the main thing you know we weren't aligned to any business outcomes it was very much output driven building a thing you know developers trying to be developing lots of things rather being effective and actually delivering what the business needed um so the first step of that is just to get to some sort of level of predictable delivery so using you know there are a couple of teams that were following I guess scrum but they were kind of following it quite blindly I guess they were, they were they're trying to fit the problem to you, you know, these kind of rigid agile ceremonies rather than looking at what where they could actually optimize, locally optimize that team to deliver the way. Um, which is what we've been kind of been doing for the last kind of 18 months is getting lots of little teams aligned to certain parts of the business, aligning them to that business domain. So e-commerce, retail, all the kind of the, the ERP kind of warehouse systems um, and mobile. And then those teams are quite are, are locally optimized now that they're able to deliver predictable, you know, business outcomes that have a real impact on, on customers. And obviously that works, but then there's the classic kind of, how do you then align all those different teams? Um, you know, there's ways of doing, you know, scaling agile, lots of people have different, lots of different opinions on that. I personally don't think it is the right thing because I, it's how do you align people, but agile isn't meant isn't about lots and lots of teams working well it's about a team delivering value you know you, when people talk about agile organizations I, I don't really understand that concept because it doesn't make sense to it so what we're trying to do is figure out how can we align different teams so that, that one of the key things that we've been looking at and we're, we're starting to look at implementing for our next year and there's things like OKRs and how we can have you know these objectives that are aligned to business goals so we're moving each team locally optimizing to having teams that are also engaged across a certain business objective and having everyone involved in that um, who needs to be. So that the team's kind of shuffling away from being about e-commerce to being about, for example, omni-channel or something like that. You've got everybody you need in there, you've got your product managers, your delivery managers, your testers, developers, everybody who's needed is within that one team you don't have to go outside of that team for what you need because you have the autonomy and the decision making within that team but a very clear outcome very clear business focus that's all about cost to delay and revision and strategy so that, that's that's kind of the thing that we've been looking at and i think it's very easy to get drawn into things like safe and scales agile and things that are probably don't optimize for the right problem um but that's what kind of what we've been looking at. I don't know how with the teams, how are the people on the call, have, how they've focused on that or what they've done. But it's, it's kind of your local optimization is good. And then how do you then optimize across a larger group of people? I'm interested to know what other people are doing in that space. Yeah, like like I say, the kind of the key thing that we did was stop throwing projects at the at the, at the developers and gave them deliver on this outcome um, was 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 really key um, and then just give them the autonomy to, to kind of do whatever it is that they want to do to kind of get that over the line and to prove the value you know uh, there's no point in having an objective with with nothing measurable so you know we th things like increase customer MPS score um, by five points um, you know it's measurable so you can turn around and go what have you done and they all they'll tell you what they've done um, you know, you haven't told them what it is that you need to do, um, and they've they've developed a load of stuff, uh, put it live, and then they've got all the metrics around it so that they can then prove that they've managed to meet that target, um, rather than you know the top down kind of um, you know you will do this and you will 
uh, show me when this is done. And you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily prove value to the business. Um, so, so kind of making sure that that's the case. The verticals throughout the company was, was key for us. You know, getting the right people involved. Um, so that you know, if you if you're going to launch something and it needs a marketing campaign, you've got a marketing person there that you can kind of go to and, and get their involvement. Um, and uh, you know, streamlining the entire development process so it's not just development against the business, um, uh, which is the way that it originally kind of looked when I joined the business. Um, you know, everybody was involved in that entire development process. Everybody knew where it was. Um, so there was no, you know, IT or, you know, the development team aren't delivering um, and proving that value across the entire piece, I think, is, is, is really key. To me, it's the product owners really having a vision of what, what they need to be delivering and distinct priorities on, um, so, so that it's almost absolute. We know what we need to do first and we know what we need to do, uh, deliver second. And then having the trust to step away and going, all right, I've set your uh, priorities, um, what the solution looks like, get on and do it. Um, there's, a, there's a separation in there um, where the, the, the product manager has a vision or the, or the product team has a vision and each individual member is down in the squads going, um, this is the vision, What's, how are we going to contribute to that? How are we going to uh, push that over the line? It's interesting, we started using uh, VSEM models uh, against each of our departments. Um, so the chief exec did one for the business to say, this is, this is what we want to achieve as an organization. And then each department was asked to produce their own VSEM model. And then I got my sub departments to do it as well. And then I looked at them to say, can I draw a line from the executive levels vision all the way down to my team's vision? can I see a clear path that says that my, my teams that are in the coal face understand what it is the business is trying to achieve. And the first time I did it, the answer was no. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the problem that we were having as well. It was exactly that. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, having essentially we have kind of, you know, top level OKRs for each team. Um, so each team is focused on one um, objective and then they, have like six or seven key results and because they're verticals throughout the organization you know everything that that team does is delivering on those values I, yeah. I found everybody went back into self-preservation which is i've got to do my job really really well so i get paid more and everybody's happy with me it was never my product offers value here but the business is going there and my route is this, my path to get there, the things I want to change to help the business grow that just didn't exist. There's that, that knowledge of, well, it wasn't there. And, and again, I think it comes back down into, it's not a short term fix to say, we're going to do DevOps. We're going to be agile. Let's do things in a lean way. It doesn't solve anything. If you don't have a clear understanding of what the value you're delivering is so uh, I don't know how you're getting on with it Andy um, but I, that's that's been my challenge I know that my, my team is not delivering at that that level of uh, we, we, we repeatedly go back now and say our our business and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very very honest example um, of something we've just done in the in the last week or so I was running a, a monthly business for you with my, my leaders and the CEO. And we were talking about how can we do some cool stuff with data streaming? What great things can we do where we move data from A to B? Uh, we could use this tool. We could use that tool. We could use Kinesis, we could use Kafka. We could do whatever it was. That sounds like lots of fun. We should do that. And we just, we just sat there and went, but what does that achieve? 
how does that help us with any of our targets? And the answer was today it doesn't. In the long term it will, but today it delivers nothing. Literally, there is no business value seen by doing that piece of work. The, we then broke it down and went, if we look at streaming as, a, as an approach to moving data, where can we apply it to add value? When we have some backup tables in our database that actually get polled by, by users. Like, why don't you stream that data, stick it somewhere, cache it, and give it to somebody to use from the cache? Then you're just going to reduce massive CPU usage on the database. And yeah, 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 let's do that. Two days later, he's done it. He's literally now got a stream running from, from, the, from the DB into Snowflake, and he's now going to open up, he's now going to turn it into cache. He's added value by asking the question, what, what do I get from doing this? Where's the value out of what I want to do? And I think when people are having ideas and the best thing about self-organizing teams, they have ideas and ways of working, asking the question, why? Why am I doing that? And keep on going back. And, and if you don't get to the answer that aligns to what the business is trying to achieve, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Well, maybe not the wrong thing, but maybe not the right thing. But the other, the other thing with the self-organizing teams is that actually you want to share that knowledge as well throughout the rest of the business. So you, there's no point in having a really high performing team that's doing really, really well um, when other teams are struggling to do the same thing. Um, so getting that knowledge shared between the teams, regular show and tells, um, and kind of making sure that if someone solved a problem, that another team is going to face in, you know, a couple of months time, kind of make sure that knowledge is shared so that you you know everybody then knows hey this is the same problem that this team had the other week let's go and have a chat with them and see how they solved it um so yeah. that you know we don't have to kind of go through the same learnings um yeah to, to kind of solve the same problem in a in a different way because if you stick five developers in a room you know you'll end up with six answers uh to, to solve a problem right and um you know it may not be the best solution um, if uh, if you're doing it, you know, 56 times over and over again. Yeah, I think ultimately, like coming back to that lean, you need to have a learning organisation. I think one of the things we've been trying to do over the last nine months is, is to share knowledge across teams. We're, you know, inherently, we had a lot of people who were the single source of truth for a lot of information. They knew the way, they, they were the Brents and the Phoenix Project. They were the people that knew how to fix something would fix it, no one else understands, no one else gains any knowledge. So one of the things that we've implemented is straight out with kind of lean Toyota is the, the kind of the, the idea of the and on card. So that when something goes wrong, we pull the and on card. So in the Toyota factory, they have a production line. If anyone is, well, everyone's encouraged to, if something is wrong, it could be like they can't screw in, uh, screw something in or there's a, a defect that they'll, they'll pull this card that's above the head and it will actually stop the production line and everyone will, you know that, that production line will stop so that we can focus on that particular problem and overall that means that you reduce the time you know the, the, the cost to fix the longer there's a problem the more downstream effects there are you know it costs more money um, but the sooner you realize there's a problem put your hand up and figure out I have an issue here you fix it and you share that knowledge with other people there's a big benefit to that so that's one of the things that we've implemented straight up with the kind of the production line at Toyota and the kind of the, the, the early days of lean agile or lean um but that's been a big thing for us is that learning organization changing it so that it isn't just individual people that have knowledge you have a team that understands the systems understands failure embraces failure learns from failure and ultimately everyone feels in a psychologically safe to raise problems yeah that's, that's really key um you know the, the safety aspect you know because otherwise you'll just end up with a bunch of people who are scared to raise anything um, and uh, you know, embrace failure is, is definitely a key motto. Because um, everything, you know, there's always something that's going to go wrong. It's better that you have people working on the problem than just kind of ignoring it. Yeah, but also if somebody leaves, that person leaves to take the knowledge with them. So it's mm. reducing the impact that one person leaving has. And the worst position to find yourself in is somebody hands the notice in, and you go, "We are in really big trouble" because they're the only person in that system, and it 
it means that we have to kind of make sure that we have shared understanding, shared knowledge and shared ownership of, of, of things as well. So it isn't just one person's responsibility to test, for example, or to, to do a deployment. It's everyone's responsibility within that team. You may have people who are slightly better at that, these very shallow silos, but ultimately the knowledge is spread across the team that anyone can do those things and it reduces the impact and the bus factor. If somebody gets hit by a bus, does the project stop? So that's something we've been struggling with. And, and, getting better out of the last 12 months, I think. I love the, uh, the Brent factor. Yeah. <laughs> my, yeah. My, my, my biggest gripe is invisible work. It's just, mm. uh, the, Brent, the Brent factor is a major one, uh, but invisible work. I, I always found that, I always found that the Brent factor goes away when you're thrown in at the deep end with something when Brent no longer works for you. You always find that if you've got enough clever people in the business to work out how to fix the problem, it might not be as quick as you'd like, and it might not be perfect. You always find that you're never dependent on one person. The, the, the biggest killer for me is, and I see it every day at the moment, is, is invisible work. The, the taps one on the shoulder can you just do this and i said that we've got a we've got a can you just architecture so car can you just add that table there sure why not i'll just add that table don't worry about it. can you just do this yeah sure I'll, I'll i'll just spin this up for you and everything is built off this the the audit trail uh if we had a fly on the wall for every one of those can you just the amount of knowledge that fly would have uh, would would put us to shame, I think, because there's just so much of it, and that that's my that's my biggest biggest challenge of all of this is the the work that just happens. I, I saw one the other day. I got a I got a release notification that came from one of the product managers, and I went to my head of delivery and went, "Hey, I didn't know we were working on that." And he turned around and looked at me and goes, "Yeah, neither did I." <laughs> I was like, "Amazing!" So we've just had an invisible release. This is perfect. And it's the starting point of how is that work being monitored? How is it being done? Why is it being done? Where did it come from? What was the source? How do we stop it? How do we not necessarily stop the work, but how do we understand it? Where its origins from? Why is it required? Was it worth doing? And we just, it just asks so many questions when you just, just see this release had happened and nobody knew about it. It was just, just one of those moments you go, oh, wow. Okay, that's a problem. Coming so, back. One solution to that is to embrace it. Um, somebody's got an itch to scratch there. They're trying to do something. Can you surface it? Can you say, well, oh, let's direct that energy? Um, your, your DevOps, your, your ops side, when they do that kind of thing, they will have something really remarkable coming out quite often. And, and if you embrace it and you bring it in and say, let's celebrate it and let's make use of it, um, and focus it in the direction that you need it to be focused. It can be very powerful. Somebody there has got a motivation. Somebody has got the courage to do this. And we don't want to squash it. We want to bring it out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, went, I went through the piece of work. I know, and I know exactly, you're right. The person was motivated and, and very positively motivated, um, generally for their own self-reward rather than anything else this is going to make me look great was was their general thought process afterwards but yeah it's when people when people are doing that it's very it's very rare it's malicious or there's bad intent behind it and to get back to brent um the the key aspect i actually see with with the brents um around where they've got the single piece of knowledge uh, uh, the store of knowledge of how to fix things is they also quite often got the courage to stick their uh, neck out and go, all right, it's got to be fixed. Let's, uh, let's go and fix it. And remember that in the Phoenix project, the solution was to remove them, him, and other people be brave enough to stand up and go, Brent's not around. I guess I'm going to have to find out. Courage is something, it, it's one of the core scrum values and we often beat it out of our, our developers um and we we, uh, we you were saying earlier somebody was saying earlier um i'll just go and do a bit of development because and and and, and deal with that and just deal be a developer and that's because they didn't have the courage 
But the flip side of the courage is the pride, the pride in the work that they've done both on a technical level and the, the product that I've produced. And those two things go hand in hand. And, and how can we encourage that to happen? Um, how can we be, have, have courage to change the way we're working to be more agile is, is one of the, the basics. Yeah. And coming, coming back to the, the verticals throughout the company again, um, you know, those, those things, um, they, they then get talked about in that stand-up that that team is delivering. The person that wanted that thing, whether they be, you know, marketing or medical or whatever, that's tapping that person on the shoulder, they then have that ability to talk directly to the developers with a bit of oversight from a product owner and so on. And then the product owner gets to make that call as to whether that goes into the sprint or not. Um, and that person that was tapping them on the shoulder then gets the ability to understand why their thing isn't as important as this other thing that's really important that needs to go out. And why, if they were to just tap that person on the shoulder, they would essentially delay a project which is add, adds more value to the business than this smaller piece of work that they actually wanted out. Um, so it's getting that visibility. The amazing thing I've seen with stuff like that is when someone says, I really want this, I really want this, I really want this. And somebody else says the same thing. Um, had it yesterday, uh, something to do with SMSs. And the, the, the person that was asking for it was really saying, they didn't need development to do anything. They didn't need my team to do a thing, mm -hmm. but they thought they did. And my team, if they'd gone directly to individuals, may have done it. They may have written the user stories, they may have developed the code. Realistically, what they needed was an off-the-shelf product that already exists that you wouldn't rewrite. They wanted a dynamic marketing tool. And their conversation should have been with marketing. So I just rang the marketing director and went, hey, you want to go and talk to Julian? He's, he's got a piece of work for you. Um, go and have that conversation. If you need my help later, I'll give you, I'll give you some help. I can help you analyze tools or I can help if we really need to do it. I'll, I'll help you with it. But actually go and have that conversation over there and redirect and repointing people rather than saying, no, I'm not doing that or just saying yes to everything. The amount of times I see people say, yeah, I'll do that for you. No problem. Really? You sure? You sure you don't want to go and see if we could do it somewhere else or in a different way, but you can see the build up as well with the small requests that if, they were thought about, you might deliver a better solution. But too many people just say, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And, and that for me, the courage is to say, no, I need to assess that and come back and understand the bigger picture before I do that piece of work because just blindly doing stuff is not courageous and it's not helpful and it does cause issues. So actually putting things back into the big picture is really important. Yeah, yeah having, having the most powerful, sorry, go. <laughs> I was just going to jump in there as well and say I'm getting a little bit conscious of time. I appreciate we have just uh, overrun slightly by 10 minutes. I did say it'd only be an hour or so. Um, but yeah, sorry, what, what were you about to say, Paul? Uh, and again, this, this comes back to the OKRs, you know, because if, if you can empower your developers to, to having key results that they have to deliver on, they can turn around and they can go, so which OKR is this, you know, which, which part of the OKR is this hitting? Is it hitting any of these? Oh, no. Okay, well, there's no value. You know, where's the value? Um, and kind of repoint that person. Um, so the most powerful thing a product owner or manager can do in an organisation is to say no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And back up with data as well. What somebody thinks is the right thing to build is usually not the right thing to build. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's like, you know, the, the, I don't, there's a real just I know we're kind of running out of time, but there's a really great article by uh, uh, a guy called Steve Denning. It's about five years old, but it's about making a. It talks about how to make a whole organisation agile, and he moves. He's kind of saying that you move away from it being about uh, business impacts to being about customer impacts, and like how a lot of big companies like Amazon have completely changed their focus to being all about the customer and whatever is needed. Um, but that's a really and it ties really, really well into having really strong product management. But that's, I'd recommend anyone read that article because it is, it is fascinating and it does change your perception of where you probably should add value and how your team should focus on what the most important thing is. Was it Steve Kenning, Andy? Is uh, that what you said? Steve Denning. 
Steve Denning, cool. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's how to make the whole organisation agile, I think it's. Okay. It's really, I'll leave the uh, yeah, uh, well, thank you all very much anyway for getting involved today. Um, I hope you know there's all been some. Oh, yeah, there's a link for it there. Perfect. Um, I hope there's been some. Uh, yeah, great learnings for everybody. I know uh, a key takeaway for me is maybe come with less talking points next time. <laughs> so I know we've only really got through two of the three. I know more of you mentioned as well about um, uh, measuring excellence and key KPIs for that, um, and when we never really got around to that. So I do apologise, but um, I'm sure we can say. <laughs> but we'll I, save think, it I think it was me that derailed it anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, th thank you all for getting involved. Uh, I hope that has been really uh, insightful for you all, and uh, I hope you know you're able to continue maybe the conversation as well. Um, you know, between yourselves, maybe uh, you know on LinkedIn or whatever, and, and you all connect on the back of this. Um, I am always looking to, to put on events, roundtables, um, you know, similar things to, to you know continue adding value as well to the people within the tech community. So if you are ever interested in getting involved in something else, if there's a particular topic you're interested in covering, um, then yeah, it'd be absolutely great to hear from you. Um, but yeah, thank you all for getting involved, as I say, and um, hope to speak to you all and see you around soon. Cool, thanks for having me. Thank you. Yes, no problem. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.